the paradigm of epigenetic rejuvenation. Uh, uh, this slide just tries to very uh, concisely sum it up, what it is, and uh, uh, then I'll go into details. So what it is, it's uh, the epigenetic mechanisms that control all kinds of gene expression in our organism. I think they're largely responsible for aging as well. And uh, I'll be presenting evidence why I think that is in later slides, but uh, here it's just a summary that first of all, we've uh, been able to epigenetically roll back cells using Yamanaka factors, not we, but I mean, we as a scientific community, which was the first clue that uh, rejuvenation is possible and epigenetic rejuvenation is possible because this happens epigenetically. You take an old cell, use Yamanaka factors, it epigenetically is reset to a pluripotent cell and it also ameliorates all hallmarks of aging. Also, another point is that we actually discovered that there are epigenetic clocks in mammals and humans. And this is also, I think, more evidence that there is a huge component, if not the primary component of epigenetics controlling aging. And of course, the most important study that uh, 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 impressed me so much that I started Ethereum was the 2016 study by Ocampo and others from the Salk Institute, which used partial reprogramming in vivo, in a live organism to greatly extend the lifespan of, of those mice and also show that it, it is possible to rejuvenate already older animals. So uh, with that said, let's go into more details about uh, everything, all the aspects that I mentioned in that slide. And the first important question, which I think is very important to answer is why do we age? Of course, the obvious answer, which always you can always answer in biology because that's what the benefits the genes that's most uh, profitable for the genes to do. They want uh, a certain lifespan for a certain ecological niche. That's why different species have very differing lifespans. And sometimes people think that there's only a small percentage of lifespan that is determined genetically. They, they sometimes say that there are studies that show that only 10% of our lifespan depends on the genes or 20% of the lifespan depends on genes. And that is true between individuals of the same species that, you know, there's a lot more of uh, environmental impact for say different people, why someone lives to 100 and another lives to 60. Yes, within species, the genetic, the genes that differ in those two individuals have very little impact on uh, why, you know, they will live how long they live. But between species, this is 100% genetically determined. Lifespan is a genetically determined trait of a species. There's a, you know, a, a wide range usually, uh, but uh, that range is determined, say between the mouse lives between two and a half and three years, but no matter what you do, it won't live for five years. It, it certainly won't live for 50 years, like uh, uh, say bats. Bats are also mammals. They live up to 40 years old, and most of them live 20 to 30 years old. And that is also genetically determined. So with that, uh, the great example, of course, are uh, turtles or Greenland sharks, whales, which live for hundreds of years. And no human has ever gotten it even closer, uh, close to, to that number. You know, Jean Calman was the uh, oldest record holder, 122 years, which, you know, there's some uh, dispute or there was at least a couple of years back, but it, it's still humans are nowhere near close to the limit of a lifespan that other organisms can reach. And this is very encouraging because it shows that there's no fundamental reason in biology why we couldn't live for hundreds of years because there are uh, animals, even mammals that live, you know, 200 years. So at least for us, the bar is, is uh, set much higher than right now. Also, we know that as I mentioned, lifespan is genetically determined and lifespan varies widely between different species, which at least to me, it tells me that this is a genetic adaptation. A given ecological niche for a, a given species is uh, genetically determined for an optimal lifespan. You know, there are some ecological niches for mice where it's optimal for the genes to very quickly have a turnover. That's why mice live for two years, three years. But at the same time, uh, naked mole rat, there's a different ecological niche. They live for up to 30 years or 35, I think is the record right now. But they're very, you know, genetically similar. They're, they haven't, uh, uh, they're pretty close relatives, evolutionarily speaking. But we understand that this, this huge variation is genetically determined and has been an evolved trait. And this is also good news because we understand that there's some plasticity in lifespan that we, we can uh, play with even with uh, very close genetically related species. 
which for us, for humans, I think is encouraging because we can, uh, without greatly modifying our genes, we can hope to uh, be able to increase our lifespan significantly. Another evidence of, of uh, that lifespan is uh, a genetically determined trait is that, as I mentioned, closely related species can have very different lifespan. And the best example of this that I know is the perch uh, genus. There's different species of perch, like the genus is uh, very closely related uh, different species like homo, like people. There's, you know, uh, the ne Neanderthals, the Dedisivans, they're all people, they're all humans, they can all interbreed, but within the same genus of perch species, some, some fish live for 12 years and others live for 200 years. So can you imagine like different species of humans having such a huge variation in lifespan? Uh, to me, it says that this is again, a genetically evolved trade, evolutionarily involved trade that is genetically determined. And it's not just, you know, a couple of different species in that genus, there's 50 different species of perch with a whole gamut, a very smooth range of differing life, lifespan. So this tells me that it is evolutionarily very uh, uh, strongly determined by, by genes. And another evidence of this that I see is in the lab that without genetic manipulation, Nobody has succeeded in greatly extending lifespan. Yes, we've used, you know, metformin, rapamycin, and other uh, uh, protectors to increase lifespan by 10, 15, 20%. In mice, still the best therapy to extend lifespan is caloric restriction, you know, starving. There's no other protector that can, unfortunately, yet uh, beat that. But with genetic manipulations, we've been able to extend the lifespan of C. elegans by 10, 10 times, 10 times. Uh, just with one knockout of one gene and two gene knockout five times. And to me in mice, so of course the, the insulin growth uh, factor knockout, they live up to almost two per, twice as much. And to me, this says that, you know, again, the genes are the primary regulator of lifespan. And of course, the loudest evidence of this that I see in nature is social insects where the same DNA identical DNA between you know, two twins can be either result in a huge lifespan for like the queen and a very short lifespan for worker castes, like in, in ants, in bees, the workers live for months, queens live for years. The best example is, uh, not the best, one of the examples is the honeybee where uh, you know, they're, they're very similar looking body composition there's no huge like difference, but the queen lives for eight years, up to eight years, and the workers live for even just in the summer, they live for weeks, less, you know, less than two months. And obviously they have the same DNA. And some people say that maybe workers live so short because they work very hard, they have to fly and forage for, for food, and that takes a toll on them. Uh, but those people seem to forget that queens they are experiencing huge levels of stress because they reproduce in huge quantities. Like they can lay up to 2000 eggs per day at, at maximum intervals, uh, which is more than their weight in eggs. Can you imagine like a woman having 2000 children per day? Of course, you know, they're undeveloped eggs, but still it takes a lot of physical toll on the, or not toll, it has a physical activity to do this kind of work for a queen, but still they can live for eight years. So obviously it's not wear and tear that, that causes them to uh, live in, in a, such a very different uh, duration between the two the castes. Same thing we observe with ants, except you know the, the range is even greater. The queen ant in, in black garden ants can live up to 30 years. You know, that small, very little insect can live for 30 years. Obviously, you know, this is not some, uh, wear and tear to me that, that uh, uh, for some reason limits the worker ants to live for only 30, uh, for, for only one or two years. And the biggest uh, uh, evidence of the plasticity of this and that it's epigenetically controlled, I see in the Indian jumping ant, where actually what can happen is that the worker ant, in case the queen dies, can become a queen, can become a reproductive uh, and actually uh, it's called gamma gates, but uh, don't worry about it. Uh, 
And not only when it does that, you know, it starts being a, a reproductive uh, species, uh, individual, but it also greatly extends its lifespan, which again, this happens epigenetically. This reprogramming process of a worker reprogramming to be a queen happens epigenetically. And this greatly increases its lifespan, which to me is all the more evidence that there is um, uh, inherent uh, limitation, epigenetic limitation in you know, different species that genes set for a, a precise lifespan. And uh, obviously the genes that uh, give the gift of long life to a queen, they're present in the workers, but for some reason they're silenced. They're not being used in a worker ant or worker bee, except when, you know, all of a sudden this worker needs to turn into a queen. Then those genes, you know, become activated and are able to prolong lifespan. So uh, to me, these are all clues that aging is uh, not just epigenetically determined, it's, uh, it's programmed into the genes and then it's executed the program of, you know, life history or uh, ontogenesis is uh, executed epigenetically. Another example, forget about social uh, uh, insects, because, you know, sometimes you can view different casts as different, uh, like DNA programs that are kind of packaged into the same DNA, but they're very different depending on the path that in the childhood the ant or the bee takes. And the, you know, they can view them as two different DNA kind of joined together. And the say the, the genetic program for a queen is very different from a genetic program for uh, a worker. But you know, at the same time, of course, the genes that are present and are able to uh, give the queen such a long life are present in a worker. But even so, uh, let's forget about the social animals and look at the different animals where there's no different castes. There's just one type of individual which can lead very differing uh, life. I mean, the lifespan can be very different depending on the time where it's born, on the conditions. And monarch butterfly is a great example because most of the generations of monarch butterfly, they live in the, sta in the United States, they only live for one or two months. But the last generation, the generation that needs to overwinter and that flies down to Mexico to do so, can live up to nine months. It's the same DNA, same individual, but you know, for when the genes needed to continue uh, reproducing, they allow it to live you know, nine times longer. And it's a very, actually, it's a demanding uh, process to fly down to Mexico, overwinter there, get pregnant because they actually reproduce in, in Mexico as well and then fly back. So it's, again, it, it speaks against the kind of the wear and tear view of what limits lifespan. And to me, it speaks volumes about the epigenetic control of lifespan that uh, genes either allow us as their, you know, uh, copying machines to live long or they don't. And even in mammals, we see this. There is this uh, montane vole in the States, in, in Montana, the, the, this uh, little um, vole uh, that very, again, lives uh, has a different lifespan depending on the time of the year when it's born. They live very short, they live for less than a year, and if they're born in the spring or the summer, they very quickly become sexually mature. They, within three weeks after birth, they can be sexually mature, but if they're born in the fall, they actually delay their puberty. They delay it until this next spring, which is a you know, seven time difference and can you imagine that, you know, uh, children was, weren't sexually mature at like 12 years old and instead, for some reason, they de delayed it until they're 80 years old. And then when they're 80, they become, you know, adults and they just be keep being children for all, all these years. Well, these mammals can do this. And of course, th they do so epigenetically because, you know, the uh, epigenetic program for puberty is just not turned on. It's, it's being put on pause. And this to me more evidence that there is so much plasticity uh, in our organism with our genetic programs that are epigenetically executed that we can hope that aging is also we would be able to to find uh, epigenetic control uh, levers for the humans not just for you know uh, organisms that are already uh, have inherently the, these mechanisms but for humans i think which uh, we can uh, adjust for our, our own, not for the genes benefits, but for, own, for our own benefits to uh, prolong our lifespan.
So uh, this is just a summary slide of what the previous observations tell me. And they tell me that aging is driven by epigenetics. Epigenetics controls all stages of organismal development, which, you know, it's, it's pretty obvious. Epigenetics is just a differential control of gene expressions. Some genes need to be on at different times. Other genes need to be very different sets of genes need to be on in different sets of tissues. You know, your brain cell needs to be expressing different genes from your skin cell and different stages of development require different, uh, uh, you know, uh, levels of genes being turned on or different genes being turned on. It's probably, and it has to be synchronized. Obviously it has to be synchronized so that, you know, your liver doesn't grow bigger than your body because it started puberty prematurely. There's obviously a synchronization center somewhere. Most likely it's in the brain. Uh, most likely it's in the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, that's the uh, HP star axis, which controls different stages of development and synchronizes them, not just controls it, but synchronizes them. And uh, epigenetics in each of the cell is the next level of synchronization, to my mind. Uh, basically, it takes cues from the uh, probably hormonal regulation. But that's how puberty starts, right? Your hormonal uh, levels change and they turn uh, in different tissues, which at the next level in different cells, turn on different programs, which start again proliferation or you, know, you, you start growing different organs. And or at the same time, for example, when uh, menopause starts that's another uh change in the hormonal levels and everything so there's different levels of regulation and ep epigenetics is the the closest level to to the cell because that to, to the genes because that's actually the last kind of level of genetic control uh, because that's it's on the actual genes on the dna or on the histones where the epigenetic regulators are sitting like uh, methylation of dna is actual control on the on the gene itself and uh, Another uh, evidence of this is that we have uh, found that there are methylation clocks that ticks with age in, in our organism in different tissues that we can actually tell how old someone is based on their epigenetic profile of their cells, which is uh, quite, uh, you know, surprising that there's actually some kind of synchronization between people of the same age between in different tissues that you, you know, you can look at their cells and say, okay, these cells come a 40 year old or 60 year old person, which is pretty surprising. And, you know, from different tissues, uh, even within the same organism, different, very different tissues show the same epigenetic time. The good news is that rejuvenation, rejuvenation is possible in, in not just in nature and in the lab as well. Of course, in nature, we know it's possible because that's what happens every time a new baby is born during fertilization, a cell is rejuvenated, an egg cell is rejuvenated, and it gets rid of all the accumulated damage that has, you know, accumulated within it until then. So an old egg cell, a human egg cell that's 20, 30 years old, becomes a completely new human without any accumulated damage. And of course, and the egg cell is 20 or 30 years old, just as, as old as the mother that carries it, because the eggs are generated during embryogenesis, the time when the mother herself was an embryo. That's the time when her egg cells became formed. So however old the mother is, the, the same time was passing to uh, potentially accumulate damage in the egg cell. And it was actually shown in different uh, papers that fertilized eggs can get rid of the damage. This was observed in nematodes. This was observed observed in mice and we uh, I think we're you know it's pretty obvious this happens in humans when the egg is fertilized that all the potentially accumulated damage is uh, get, get gotten rid of. Also in yeast this was observed that yeast can uh, not only reset their lifespan their replicative lifespan upon sporulation which is you know a form of uh, uh, reproduction sexual reproduction uh, but they can get rid of the accumulated damage as well, which was a bit surprising because they thought, you know, yeast just throws out the damage, but uh, no, actual yeast cells, if they have accumulated damage up, uh, until sporulation, during the sporulation process, they know how to get rid of it. And in nature, there are other ways we can observe rejuvenation. I'm, I'm sure you know about the jellyfish, the Turritopsis jellyfish that is able to, from a you know, old organism become essentially an embryo of itself and rejuvenate the, the whole process, which, you know, probably is not a, a applicable to humans because we want to keep our memories. 
but we know that potentially this this is uh, possible in an organism and there's another whole genus of jellyfish the aurelia that also uh, know how to do this Be basically turn from an adult to an embryo closer to humans they're insects beetles that also know how to come back to previous stages of metamorphosis for example this beetle in the lab this in such a way was uh, lifespan was increased by almost 10 times this beetle was starved for food and that made it return back to previous stages of metamorphism and that way the scientists were able to kind of like that the voles in montana voles that were putting on pause their development uh, this was done in the beetle they're rolling back their development and this way instead of leaving just for eight weeks they, they this way they live for two years so now we come to epigenetic rollback the the idea that you can use epigenetics to periodically rejuvenate the organism. And it all began, and the field of it, epigenetics began in probably 1940s. You can say that this is the, the moment that uh, the, uh, uh, the field was started by uh, Conrad Harold Waddington, the Wadding, famous Waddington landscape, where he proposed this concept of epigenetic differentiation of a cell, how a cell becomes a stem cell becomes some kind of differentiated cell, a skin cell or a brain cell. And he had this idea of a landscape, I'm, I'm sure you've heard of it, where it's like a, a cell, stem cell rolling down the hill and it, depending on the path it takes, ends up in the, at the bottom being this one or another type of differentiated cell. And at the time, the thinking was that this is an irreversible process, like a cell cannot climb back up the, the landscape to become a stem cell again. Once it's a differentiated, differentiated cell, it cannot change its identity. And the thinking was that maybe during this kind of rolling down the hill, what happens is that certain genes are removed from a cell or dissolved in a cell. And that's why it only retains the genes uh, responsible for it being the, the cell, the ultimate cell that it is. And uh, I guess the... Um, Inspiration for this was the red blood cells that, you know, people observed that they actually don't have a nucleus. So they thought, you know, maybe that's what happens in another cell. They get rid of some parts of the genes and, and that's why things are uh, irreversible. But that was, uh, that idea was uh, 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 reversed or at least, you know, the, the evidence contrary to that idea was provided by Sir John Gordon in 1962 when he took a cell uh, somatic cell from an adult organism and used it in, in a previously nucleated egg cell to show that actually, you know, all the genetic information necessary to make a new organism is still retained in the fully differentiated cell. So the idea that, you know, something is lost was incorrect. That, so there must be some other way that uh, uh, differentiate hap differentiate ha differentiation happens and maybe that way is not irreversible. Uh, and this was proven to be true conclusively in 96 with the dolly the sheep that was able to be cloned, fully cloned from, again, uh, a differentiated cell where they took the DNA of that differentiated cell and put it in the uh, egg cell of uh, another sheep. And they actually, the, the sheep that was born was obviously from the DNA of the, of the donor and not the egg cell, which, you know, they, they, they actually uh, used a, a very different type, very different looking type for the surrogate mother so that they, you know, once the, the lamb is born, they know for sure who, who it came from. Was the DNA from the, from the donor, which looked like this, or was it from the mother, which looked like this? And uh, the, once Dolly, you know, was born, it was obvious that the, it actually was a clone. So the DNA that uh, established its ultimate fate was the one that they inserted into the previously enucleated egg cell. And here is the, the one of the creators of Dolly with, with his creation. Uh, there are a lot of myths surrounding Dolly. Some, some people for some reason thought that Dolly was born old or she died prematurely because of some genetic aberrations. But uh, those myths were quickly put to rest. I mean, Dolly did die prematurely, but she died from a viral infection but uh, there was nothing wrong with her DNA. They ha actually then cloned many more dollies, the, the, like at least four of these in this photo, uh, and they lived a uh, normal lifespan. And since then, this, this uh, process of somatic cell nuclear transfer has been used 
uh, in you know thousands of, of experiments showing that you know there's nothing wrong with the DNA of the donor cell. And not, uh, I mean, uh, that's why we can uh, re reproduce these results. The biggest breakthrough, I think, to, to in our field of epigenetic uh, rejuvenation came in 2006 with Sinia Yamanaka's discovery that you can actually, uh, like he completely uh, refu re refudiated the, this idea of irreversibility of differentiation, this, this dogma that, you know, you're rolling down the hill and you can't get back up. Yamanaka showed that you can, in fact, get back up. A, a skin cell can retrace its steps back and become again a pluripotent, essentially an embryonic cell. And the, the genius of Yamanaka was that he looked at the embryonic cells, what kind of genes are expressed in them, and was able to find four out of a list of 24 different genes, the, the four key genes that are actually responsible for, not only for keeping a pluripotent cell pluripotent, but also for being able to uh, uh, make and already differentiate itself, become back a pluripotent cell, which was, you know, a very non-obvious thing. And uh, that's, I guess, the, the, that's the biggest uh, luck that we as, as, as humans have, that it actually turned out that this is very potentially simple process of just, if you are able to uh, express the genes that are responsible for this pluripotency in a terminally differentiated cell, they actually turn themselves, they know how to return back the differentiated cell into this pluripotent or stem or embryonic state. And so they had to update the, the Waddington landscape or epigenetic landscape to, to be able to uh, retrace the steps back. They, they made it reversible. As, and now we know that, you know, it doesn't matter where you as a cell are, you can always end up, well, unless you lost the nucleus, like a red blood cell. But if you have the nucleus, you can return back to pluripotent state. And this led to the idea of people in our field starting to think, okay, uh, can you then use this process to rejuvenate cells? Because it was observed that, you know, uh, cells that are uh, with the Yamanaka factors turned back into embryonic cell, pluripotent cells, they're actually rejuvenated. So the question was, can we like uh, uh, split this rejuvenation from uh, becoming again pluripotent? And from what I found, the first person to think about this, or at least to uh, put a paper with the words epigenetic rejuvenation was Prim Singh. And, and this is the 2010 publication in, in, in which he actually talks about can we use this this uh, paradigm of epigenetic rejuvenation to, uh, uh, or you know, the Imanaka factors to have epi uh, epigenetic rejuvenation? And then the the next uh, uh, paper that I saw in terms of the timeline is a 2011 paper that actually observed this rejuvenation in uh, the iPS cells or the cells that have been using Imanaka factors returned back into pluripotent state. And this was under the direction of Jean-Marc Lemaitre from uh, the French Institute in CERM, where they showed that even centenarian cells, like cells from 100-year-old people, were fully rejuvenated. And this opened uh, an even bigger door into the investigation. Okay, can we now use this uh, power of Yamanaka factors to rejuvenate uh, cells in the organism? And, uh, you know, the, the other clues that we saw that this is possible, it was from uh, other uh, publications that have looked at various hallmarks of aging in, in the context of what happens to them during reprogramming. And they show that uh, they're all of the hallmark, hallmarks, cellular hallmarks of aging are rejuvenated in the process of using Imanaka factors in reprogramming. And parabiosis was uh, another uh, observation that was uh, another earlier clue that this is could be potentially possible. Okay, I saw that I have five more minutes left, so I'll, I'll try to speed up a bit. Um, uh, another uh, important uh, step in uh, translating this paradigm was from Tom Randall, who actually asked the question already like in the paper, essentially saying, okay, can we now use the Yamanaka factors in the context of rejuvenation in, in an organism? And this is the paper in 2012 in which he asked this question. And it inspired, uh, or uh, I think it inspired Manuel Serrano, who, who tried doing this in a mouse model. He created transgenic mouse models where you can induce Yamanaka factors on demand. And he uh, 
in, in that paper, he did not look into rejuvenation, but he saw that you know a, a seven day course of reprogramming actually results in teratomas. So uh, he, his paper was less about rejuvenation, more about what, what bad things happen if you induce human factors in vivo. And uh, a parallel discovery was that you can actually fully rejuvenate mitochondrial function with inducing these factors in, 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 in vitro if you take centenarian cells, you can restore mitochondrial function, uh, function after reprogramming. But the biggest breakthrough, at least in my mind, was the 2016 paper from Alejandro Ocampo and uh, under the uh, group of Juan Carlos Espiso Belmonte from Salk, where he showed that using partial reprogramming, you can greatly extend lifespan in progeric mice. You can extend it up to 50% if you look at this control group or 33% if you look at, at this control group. And I, I won't get into the details because of the time constraints, but uh, the most important part is that the mice, they not only looked younger, the, the treatment group, but they were physically younger based on various parameters, uh, you know, senescent cells, double strand breaks, et cetera. And if you look at their tissues, they were much closer to wild type tissues than to the control group tissues, which, you know, it, it, it's visually striking that, you know, the, treated group was much closer to wild type animals than to uh, their uh, animals of the same age that did not receive the treatment. And they had fewer double strand breaks, DNA double strand breaks, they had more fair hair follicles. And uh, even wild type mice after the treatment were they showed rejuvenation in their tissues, in their muscle tissues, for example, on this slide. But the biggest problem is teratomas. And, uh, you know, to avoid teratomas, the, the, the what we need to do is to limit the expression of Yamanaka factors either temporally or by tissue to avoid tissues where the teratomas can happen or to have a very short duration of Yamanaka factor activation so that teratomas just don't have enough time to form. And I'll skip the couple of articles that show what happens when we don't limit the expression of factors temporally and but just show that if you do limit this, for example, in the brain, only a seven day duration of Yamanaka factors, there are no teratomas observed. But the greatest uh, observation about partial reprogramming, why we think it's possible to have, even to have epigenetic rollbacks is that reprogramming happens gradually. So the, the epigenetic age decrease during reprogramming happens gradually and loss of identity by the, by the cell also happens very gradually. So before a cell loses its identity, before it stops use, doing its function, it is rejuvenated. So we can find a therapeutic window where we can have both. We can have rejuvenation without loss of function. And this is what Prim Singh again observed in 2019 and, and, and wrote in his paper. I'll skip the epigenetic clock because I'm sure you know about it. Just uh, tell you what we try to do as a therapy. The idea is to be able to freeze our mortality rate, which raises exponentially, to freeze it at at least you know a 60 year level. Because even if you're 60 year old, you think you're old, but your mortality rate is not that, it's not that large. It's one in a hundred annual mortality rate. So if we freeze it at that point, point, you can still expect to live a hundred years. Of course, you know, our, our goal is more closer to this, but even if we you know, reach this goal with the therapy, which periodic rollbacks will be, you know, at least stopping the exponential increase, that'll be good enough for us. And the idea to how the therapy would, would work is that you integrate the genes responsible for the reprogramming into the organism once, into the right tissues, and then you periodically activate them with a small molecule, just like in the Ocampo experiment where they use doxycycline uh, to activate those genes on, uh, they use the weekly periodicity. I think for humans, it would be monthly or maybe even yearly because we have much slower processes happening. And this would what we hope to accomplish using the, the therapy as, at Eutherium. And the R&D goals, I mean, I'll, I'll skip over because I'm, I'm running out of time, although I thought I still have until the hour. But um, uh, basically, we're, uh, our goal is to first make sure the therapy is safe, to avoid teratomas in fast dividing tissues, and then to also be able to, to activate those genes in, in, with an additional level of safety. So we want to build in safety logic to prevent overexpression of humanaka genes to avoid teratomas 